So first, let me say uh, thank you so much to the Secretary General for coming and for such a generous uh, introduction. And thank you to President Park for the invitation to be here. This is a great honor for me. Uh, if I started talking about uh, uh, your uh, fellow citizen, Ban Ki-moon, and his great service to the world, I would give another lecture. But let me uh, simply say I've had the great good fortune, as he said, to know him now for oh, more than 25 years, uh, and uh, to be amazed at his service to Korea, but also to the world. And as a Secretary General, uh, every day he was doing remarkable things to make a better environment, a peace, more peaceful environment for all of us. Uh, I probably shouldn't tell the story, but I will in any case, that uh, when he first showed up at the Kennedy School in 1983, uh, at the time the school was so small that uh, I would welcome all the new students at the reception. They would come by and I would shake their hands and say, welcome, and they would say hello, and they would move along. And so when he shook my hand, he said, uh, uh, hello, uh, uh, my name is JFK. Uh, uh, and I said, uh, I was a little surprised, but I said, well, welcome. And then, <laughs> eventually I went and asked him, and he said, uh, JFK, just from Korea. Okay? <laughs> Uh, so, his nickname among his fellow students uh, was JFK, uh, and I think it was an appropriate uh, and inspired uh, 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 similarity. So, uh, I'm so happy that he's here today, and I enjoy the opportunity to continue uh, working with him, and I've always admired this Korean contribution to international peace and security. So, the topic today the title of my book is Destined for War, question mark, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? But the topic of my lecture is going to be peace or the avoidance of war. Because the question about which I'm passionate today and have been since writing this book and publishing it a year ago is the one that the Secretary General identified, which is uh, how can the US and China and friends like South Korea, uh, together with imagination and ingenuity and adaptability, escape Thucydides' trap? So where I'm going with this lecture in the conclusion is a question, and the question is how to escape Thucydides' trap. And in this, I think we have a, a at least slightly hopeful or promising pointer in the recent developments on the Korean Peninsula, just in the last six months, where relative to where we were at the beginning of this year, I can see at least a glimmer of hope about the possibility of diffusing a potential crisis that could have been the path to war on the Korean Peninsula, but indeed a war that could have involved the US and China in a global war. So what can we learn from that lesson, as well as from the rest of history, uh, for making this the fifth case of no war, in the last 500 years, as opposed to the 13th case of war. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's where I'm going in the conclusion, and I'm hoping that in the conversation afterwards and in the questions and answers, people may have some suggestions about how, specifically, how to escape Thucydides' trap. And an example of how would be diffusing crises that could otherwise have served as triggers to war, of which the events on the Korean Peninsula would be a, an example. But let me tell you what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to introduce you to a great thinker. Second, 
I'm going to present a big idea, a big idea that if you get your head around it, will help you look through the news and noise of the day to the underlying driver of what's happening in international relations totally, but also especially with impact here in Korea. And then third, I'm going to explore a provocative question, a fateful question, the subtitle of the book, Can America and China and their friends escape Thucydides' trap? So let's see here. The great thinker, uh, when I gave this lecture in Beijing uh, about uh, four months ago, I told them I'm going to introduce a great thinker, and they imagined it was Xi Jinping. Okay? <laughs> uh, so I said, I'm not saying anything about uh, the, the wonderful thoughts of Xi Jinping that have been written into the, into the Constitution, but the great thinker I have in mind is Thucydides. Okay? Now, who is Thucydides? Uh, for some of you, uh, he may not be part of your mental library. If he's not, especially you students, shame on you. This is an opportunity for you to meet a great thinker and to engage him. So Thucydides was the father and founder of history. He wrote the first ever history book. Its title is The History of the Peloponnesian War. So Thucydides uh, lived about 2,500 years ago, roughly a contemporary of Confucius, in classical Greece, and he wrote about the war, the Peloponnesian War, between the two great city-states of classical Greece that laid them both waste. So Thucydides is somebody whom you should get to know, you can actually go online and download for free the book, The History of the Peloponnesian War. And I would suggest as a start, just download book one, 100 pages. Every other page, if it doesn't knock your socks off, check your pulse. Okay? This is a serious thinker. In fact, in my book, I use it from it at the beginning of every chapter of the book, I have a little quote from Thucydides. Just to remind you, he has many big ideas. The one that I'm focusing on is the big idea I want to present to you today, which is this, Thucydides' trap. Thucydides wrote famously about the Peloponnesian War, that it was the rise of Athens, that was the upstart, and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made the war inevitable. So Thucydides' trap is the dangerous dynamic that occurs when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power. In this case, Athens was the upstart. After the defeat of the Persians, Athens was exploding with imagination. The Athenians were inventing everything. So drama, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Aristophanes, uh, philosophy, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, architecture. I just came for, to Korea from, from Greece. I was looking out my window at the, at the uh, Acropolis and the Parthenon. The Parthenon was a building built by Ictius for Pericles 2,500 years ago. There's not a finer building in the world today. Nowhere. History. Herodotus and Thucydides. Uh, democracy. That's an Athenian democracy. It's where democracy was invented with Pericles. Uh, uh, a navy. The first professional navy. So on and on. S Sparta had been the ruling power in Greece for a hundred years. So the Spartans thought, what the hell is going on in Athens? What do these people think they're doing? They just get up every morning and think of new things to do. 
So a rising power feels, I deserve more say, I deserve more sway. The current arrangements don't take full account of my interest. And the ruling power, Sparta, fearfully thinks, wait a minute, they're trying to change the status quo. They're trying to upset who's at the top of every pecking order. What do they think they're doing? They should know their place. In this dynamic, rarely is it the case that Athens decides this is a good time to attack Sparta. That didn't happen. Or Sparta, we should attack Athens. Instead, in this dangerous dynamic, a third party's action or provocation or accident or event becomes a trigger that one or the other of the major competitors feels obliged to respond to, and then one thing leads to the other, and at the end of the story, they find themselves in a war. So in, in the Peloponnesian case, Athens and Sparta each had decided war was a bad idea. They had actually negotiated, brilliantly, a 30-year peace, which was doing fine 15 years on. But two of their allies, Corinth and Coursera, got into a conflict. They each felt obliged to support their ally. Then one thing led to the other, and there you were. Or if you want a more uh, vivid example, in 1914, how in the world could the assassination of an archduke, who was the successor to the throne in Vienna have provided the spark that created a war that burned down the whole of Europe. It's, it's a case that deserves to be studied. I have a good chapter on it in the book. It's something that I've been studying for 50 years. I still don't know the answer. It's amazing to imagine. If you had offered any of the leaders who were involved a chance for a do-over, in 1918, they would never have made the choices they made. But the Archduke was assassinated. His father, who was the emperor in Vienna, thought he's obliged to punish the Serbs. That was reasonable. The Russians felt that, that the Austrians were going to overdo it as they punished the Serbs, and so they were trying to protect their orthodox allies. The Germans had only one ally, the Austrians, so they supported them. The French had a treaty relationship with the Russians. So one thing led to the other, and at the end of a sequence that occurred over about six weeks, all the parties found themselves at war. As I say, after the war, what had happened to the ambitions of every one of the leaders? They had lost. So the Austria-Hungarian emperor was trying to hold his empire together. Empire is dissolved, he's out. Russian czar trying to back the, the, uh, the Serbs. He'd been overthrown by the Bolsheviks. His whole regime is gone. The German Kaiser is supporting his ally in Vienna. He's tossed out. The French, they're supporting their military ally, the, the Russians. They've been bled of their youth for a whole generation. Society never recovers. And Britain, which has been a creditor for the world for a hundred years and ruled the world, now becomes a debtor and is on a slow slide to decline. So the fact that a war is not in someone's interests and that nobody wants a war doesn't mean a war cannot occur. So Thucydides' trap is this dangerous dynamic. And as President Park has already mentioned in my book, I review the last 500 years of history. I find 16 cases where rising power threatens to displace a ruling power. 12 of them end in war. Four of them in no war. So to say that war between the US and China is inevitable would be wrong on the record. Not inevitable. To say that the odds are against us and that if we accept simply business as usual, we should expect to go the way of history as usual, would be correct. So that's Thucydides' trap. 
Now first, I want to make a comment about this trap. I find it difficult because I even don't know how to pr pronounce its name. <laughs> you know, the Thucydian trap that people talk about. The so-called Thucydides trap. The Thucydides trap. The Thucydides trap. The Thucydides trap. Thucydides trap. The Thucydides trap. Okay, so Thucydides trap has entered the bloodstream of the current debate both in Beijing and in Washington and I think elsewhere appropriately because this is a lens that will help you look through the noise to see the underlying dynamic in the relationship between the U.S. and China as a rising China threatens to displace a ruling U.S. So that's the underlying, the, the basic storyline. Uh, just in case uh, those of you who are not interested in the policy world, last year the blockbuster movie was Wonder Woman. And if you'll go back and look at the movie, you'll see that when Wonder Woman goes to dance with Ludendorff, he's trying to put her down by quoting this line, peace is only an armistice between the last war and the next war. And she, being a wise lady, says, Thucydides. Okay? So if you hear a piece of wisdom that sounds like something that you should have known, say Thucydides, you'll be, have a good chance of being correct. This is another one of Thucydides' good insights. So here, the last summit between Xi Jinping and Barack Obama, both of them are talking Thucydides' trap, understanding that it's the destructive tensions that occur in this interaction between the emerging power and the established power, but that if parties find ways to work together imaginatively, they should be able to escape Thucydides' trap. So again, just to go back here one second. The question, the fateful question, is the subtitle of the book, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? And my answer in the book to that is very professorial. So it's no and yes. So no, if we settle for business as usual, if we accept diplomacy as usual, if we only see statecraft as usual, then we should expect history as usual. And history as usual in this case would be a war. Even though it would be crazy, and even though after the war everyone would agree that this made no sense, and that it had destroyed all the things we care about. But on the other hand, yes, we can escape Thucydides' trap. If we remember Santayana's great line, only those who refuse to study history are condemned to repeat it. So there's no obligation for human beings to make the same dumb mistakes over and over, though we often do. We can sometimes learn from our own mistakes. Maybe if we're slightly smarter, we can learn from somebody else's mistakes. So my objective in writing this book is to try to motivate a conversation about what we can learn from both the failures and the successes on the historical record, plus our imagination, to try to address the question how to escape Thucydides' trap, which, as I said before, is where I'm going at the end of this. So, uh, three questions. First question, what has been the biggest geopolitical event of the last 25 years? Second question, if we look forward 25 years, what will be the biggest geostrategic challenge for the world? And third, the same old question, can we escape Thucydides' trap? To the first question, what's been the biggest event in the last 25 years? My answer is the rise of China. Never before has a country risen so far, so fast, on so many different dimensions. Those of you who live here in Korea 
probably are more conscious of this. But if you haven't been watching carefully, you probably still haven't quite got the whole picture. So I have a pretty good chapter in the first, the first chapter of the book is on the rise of China that just tried to give you a jolt. And I quote uh, Vaclav Havel, the former Czech president, who has a great line. He says, things have happened so fast, we haven't yet had time to be astonished. So to illustrate this, I compare this bridge at Harvard with a bridge in Beijing. So this is the bridge that goes across the Charles River at Harvard between the business school and the Kennedy School. It's called the Anderson Bridge. I can see it out of the window of my office at the Kennedy School. The conversation about renovating this bridge began when I was dean of the Kennedy School. And I quit being dean in 1989. The project began in earnest in 2012. It was a two-year project. In 2014, they said it's not yet finished. Take another year. In 2015, they said it's not yet finished. It'll take one more year. 2016, they said, we're not telling you when it's going to be finished. <laughs> but it's three times over budget. Now, actually, uh, it's essentially finished, but they've been embarrassed about how long it took, so they haven't had a ceremony to declare that, it's, uh, that the project is over, and it's three times over budget. So, for those of you who go to Beijing from time to time, you probably have ridden across a bridge called the Sanyan Bridge. It's got twice as many lanes of traffic as the, as the Anderson Bridge. In 2015, the Chinese decided they wanted to renovate it. How long did it take to complete the project? Take a guess. Please. Six months, ten months, how much? So the answer is 43 hours. <laughs> you can go to YouTube and watch this uh, video speed it up. They, of course, work at night. So the deputy mayor in Beijing I saw uh, last year, and he had been at a Kennedy School executive program, and I said, if you would send your people who did the Sanyan Bridge to Cambridge, I would even make a small contribution if they would finish off the Anderson Bridge. So 43 hours. So in my course at Harvard, I give students a quiz. A quiz has 50 key indicators. This is a short version that you can find in the book. And it asks, when could China become number one? And students have to write on the right-hand side their answer, 2020, 2030, not in my lifetime. So the biggest automaker or manufacturer, trading nation, largest middle class, most billionaires, greatest solar power capacity, fastest supercomputer, leading AI research, primary engine of global economic growth, largest GDP. So you don't have to take a quiz, but you can imagine your answers. Then I show them a second slide, which says already. So all these things already happened. So in 2011, China became the number one manufacturing country. In 2015, the largest middle class. Actually, the Chinese middle class is larger than the total American population. Yeah. Most billionaires in 2016, fastest supercomputer, they won the prize in 2010. There's going to be another contest this year, and they may not win. It's a close call, but they'll certainly win three of the first five places. Uh, primary engine of economic growth, every year since the Great Recession. And most Americans are shocked by the fact that in 2014, China actually became the largest economy in the world, measured by the yardstick that both the IMF and the CIA 
think is the best yardstick for comparing national economies, namely purchasing power parity. So if you go look at the big takeaway from the IMF World Bank meeting in 2014, the takeaway is China is now the largest economy in the world. So this is the rise of China, and I think in every dimension, in every arena, in every space, one will see China rivaling the U.S. and others to become number one, in some cases surpassing, in some cases a competition. The second question then is looking forward the next 25 years, what will be the biggest geostrategic challenge? And my answer is the impact of the rise of China on the U.S. and the international order that the U.S. has been the principal architect of for the last seven decades. So this is a cartoon I made for testimony to the Senate Armed Services Committee back in 2014. Another former student of mine, Jack Reed, is the ranking Democratic senator on the committee, and they wanted a testimony as a context for reviewing the Obama administration's initiative towards Asia. You remember the name of the Obama administration initiative towards Asia? What was it called? The pivot, okay or sometimes called the rebalance. That what was the pivot about? It was about putting less weight on our left foot in the Middle East fighting wars in order to put more weight on our right foot in Asia where the future is. That's what President Obama said. So I said, well, for perspective on this, we should think of the US and China as if they were two children on a playground on opposite ends of a seesaw. In 2004, and the size of each of them is the size of their GDP. So in 2004, China is about 20% the GDP of the US. In 2014, about equal, just slightly larger. On this trajectory in 2024, 40% larger. So what? So while the U.S. has been discussing whether to put more weight on our left foot or on our right foot, the growth of China has, both, has essentially lifted both feet off the ground. So the impact of the rise of China on the U.S., on Americans' conception of who they are and what our role in the world is, and on the international order. One sees this in every domain. Here's just one example, trade, which you're familiar with. In 2000, the beginning of the century, the U.S. was the principal trading partner of all the Asians, essentially. And today, China is. You can see here for South Korea, about almost three quarters. So what does it matter that I'm your principal trading partner? Well... Uh, I think the South Koreans have seen recently what happened to latte, or what happened to uh, the sales of uh, cars. Uh, when China is displeased, they play very hard ball, squeezing people economically where they can to try to get compliance. And I think that level of trade uh, interaction, which is crucial for growth, and an important part of the story of how all the Asian countries are becoming richer is also simultaneously a story of how China is becoming more influential. One could go through every arena and tell this same story, but for today, I think this should be sufficient. In the book, I have a lot more. So the, the world's premier China watcher until he died in 2015, was the founder and prime minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. Unfortunately, he was a mentor of mine and uh, a person who uh, spent a long time trying to help me understand China. He said I would never understand China, but he would, in any case, try to teach me as much as he could. 
So I wrote with Bob Blackwell a little book on uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the Grand Master, back four or five years ago, which basically consists of us asking him questions and then getting the nuggets of his answers. So one of our questions is this one. Are China's current leaders serious about displacing the U.S. as the predominant power in Asia in the foreseeable future? Well, that's a provocative question. Uh, if you read my old professor and mentor Henry Kissinger's book, 600 pages about China, it says, on the one hand and on the other hand. Okay? It's complicated. So you won't find many people who will answer this question in the, chi in the China specialist community. But Lee Kuan Yew was 90 years old and said what he thought. He says, of course, why not? Who could imagine otherwise? How could they not aspire to be number one in Asia and in time in the world? So I have a discussion of that in the book. I think that's basically correct. I think that's part of turning those long-term objective. And in fact, if you wanted any uh, uh, reinforcement of that proposition, looking first at the speech that Xi Jinping gave in October at the 19th Party Congress, and then week before last at the foreign policy uh, uh, gathering in Beijing, uh, basically, China seeks to become the predominant power in Asia. Now, Chinese would say about this, well, but don't put us in the Thucydidean dynamic because we're not a rising power. We're just a returning power. We're only being restored to our natural place, which we enjoyed for 4,000 years until you showed up you Westerners, with your technology a couple of hundred years ago to exploit us. But now you're going to recede and we're going to return to our position as the Middle Kingdom, the center of the universe, in which other parties in our region, other parties that we can see, will be tributaries. They will revolve around the sun, as the cosmology of China did in the past. So I would say that's the dynamic one seeing with the impact of the rise of China everywhere, but especially on a country that's defined itself as being number one. So Americans think that somehow being number one is our God-given right or the natural condition of mankind or it's somewhere stated in authority, but in any case, that's the way things are supposed to be. I actually believe that, okay, uh, as a red-blooded, red, red-necked American. So that's, that's where, where I feel. And so when I look and see a China that's bigger and stronger and rivaling the U.S. in different domains, actually displacing the U.S. in different domains, I feel uncomfortable. Well, Thucydides helped us understand this problem. For a ruling power, it is very normal to think the way things are are the way things are supposed to be. They're not just the way things are supposed to be, they're right, they're good. They produce order. They provided opportunity for everybody. And actually, this is often true. And especially is it true in Asia. The security and economic order that the Americans provided in the period since World War II has been the underlying enabler of miracles across Asia, including in Korea, but especially in China. So, in that sense, the, the impulse to say, well, everyone should be grateful, and they should just support this order, because it's clearly been good for everybody, is an understandable view of the ruling power. But for a rising power, as Thucydides explains, whether it's the rising Germany as it rivals Britain a hundred years ago, right before World War I, or rising China today, the thought is, well, no, but wait a minute, I'm just being myself. I'm just trying to grow up to exercise my rights 
to express my interest, to pursue my interests. This is quite normal. So you see this story, this dynamic, in basically disruptive upstarts and incumbents in business, actually in gorillas between the alpha gorilla and the wannabe. Or one can sometimes see this in a family dynamic. So the rising power versus the ruling power and the psychological consequences of that and the ways in which that then can lead to misperceptions and miscalculations and therefore vulnerability to accidents is the core Thucydide and dynamic. The committee meets today to consider the nomination of General James Mattis to be the Secretary of Defense of the United States. I thank uh, both Senator Nunn and Senator Cohen for being here. He's probably the only one uh, here at this table who can hear the words Thucydides trap and not have to go to Wikipedia. Of course, Secretary Cohen has insulted every member of this committee by suggesting that we don't readily understand that. Uh, we're going to have to manage that uh, competition between us and China. Uh, there's another uh, piece of wisdom from antiquity that says fear, honor, and interest always seem to be the root causes of why a nation chooses to go to hostilities. Okay, so fear, honor, and interest as the motives for war. Where does that line come from? Thucydides. Okay, so again, check the book, you'll see. That's another one of the quotations that's quite relevant. Thucydides has a hundred big ideas. I'm only here talking about one, or focused on one. Final question. Here we are. So here's Xi Jinping at Davos in January 17. We're good. Yeah. Uh, as he says, and I agree with this very much, as long as we are sensible, we can avoid Thucydides trap. In his terms, having mutual respect, recognizing core interests, building a new model of great power relations. So, as Wang Qishan, the vice president of China, says, why do we call for a new model? Because we understand the old model has led, typically, in Thucydide in terms, to wars that people could have avoided. So the question is how to escape Thucydide's trap. And that's a question I'm hoping for the conversation that we can engage. So let me say just uh, three minutes about uh, uh, what's happened recently on the Korean Peninsula as an example of what is uh, at least suggestive uh, about ways in which we can escape Thucydides trap. Since that's the purpose, not to be fatalistic, not to be pessimistic, but to try to say, what can we do? So at the beginning of the Trump administration, so when Trump became president, actually in the handoff between Obama and Trump, Obama said to Trump at their meeting, uh, North Korea, the challenge, is going to define your presidency. Because you're inheriting a hand in which early on North Korea is likely to acquire an ability, reliably, to strike the American homeland with nuclear weapons. And that's going to transform everything. So Trump listened to that, he went out, and he tweeted immediately, not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. And when he assembled the people that work for him, uh, he said to them, and he said this repeatedly, I heard him say this once, he said, I am not Obama. I am not Bush. I am not Clinton. I don't know how they let this happen. North Korea go from nowhere to then having nuclear material and then having nuclear bombs 
and then having missiles that can attack South Korea, and then having missiles that can attack Japan, and about to have missiles that can attack San Francisco. But this is crazy. This little country, who, who has let this happen? And he was equally scathing about the Chinese. What have they been doing? How did they let this happen? So he determined, no, I am not going to let this happen. Now, there's scene one. Scene two, as he talks to his advisors, uh, he says, I'm telling you, the first path is not acceptable. But it was explained to him, and I wrote a piece call that, that you can read if you go just to, my, to the Belfort website. I said, there's just three roads, only three roads. First road is we continue on the road that we're on. North Korea conducts more ICBM tests, and it becomes to have a reliable capability to strike the U.S. And that's most likely what's going to happen. There's a second road, which is the U.S. attacks North Korea to prevent the first road. The difficulty with that path is that it probably starts a second Korean War. And a further difficulty with that is that if you go back and study what happened in the first Korean War, that was ultimately a war between China and the United States. So Americans and Chinese did most of the killing in the first Korean War of Americans and Chinese and Koreans. So that doesn't sound a very attractive option either. So the third option was what I called a minor miracle. And I said, I didn't know exactly the proportions of it, but I was praying for a miracle, even though I thought it was unlikely. But a miracle would involve getting on a path to negotiations between the U.S. and North Korea that would be headed towards the denuclearization of North Korea over some period of time, but in any case would not involve testing ICBMs or nuclear weapons and would not involve an attack on North Korea. So go back and do it again in terms of where we are now. There's only three paths. So we can return to the first path, which we may do if things collapse. North Korea goes back to testing ICBMs, which they would do. With the next set of tests or the one after that, CAA will say they have a reliable capability to strike the U.S. We could talk about how bad that is. So it's not bad simply that they can attack the U.S., though that's bad. The question is, what will a North Korea that can attack the U.S do next. And that's where I think it gets very bad. Okay? So that takes us to option two. When Trump said to Secretary Mattis, I want military options for attacking North Korea, Mattis said to him what the Defense Department has said regularly, excuse me, you're talking about starting a second Korean War. And remember what happened in the first Korean War. In Trump's case, this required some explanation, okay? Since this was not a history that he remembered vividly. But Mattis explained it over and over. Indeed, every time Mattis had a chance to talk about this, he said, and he testified many times to Congress about it, we can have a war, but the consequences are going to be catastrophic. Don't think about this as some small war. Think about hundreds of thousands of people being killed as a result of such a war, and maybe more. So the Defense Department was not enthusiastic about this, but ultimately gave uh, Trump a menu of six options that could start with something as small as an attack on uh, missile launch pads in North Korea to disrupt them so that they couldn't test ICBMs. But the danger in all of these was that the next step would be artillery raining down on Seoul, and then the suppression of that, and then the Second Korean War. So that's not a very attractive option. So the third option 
only needs to be better than the first two options to seem promising. Now, is the start that has been made the one that I would have made if I were orchestrating it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So I come from the expert community that's been trying to do this in other instances, but Trump's argument to the experts is, well, I understand what you've done, but look at the results. And one has to say the results are not impressive. North Korea has a nuclear arsenal today. It has short-range missiles. It has medium-range missiles. So the efforts to start down a third path, I think, are at least imaginative and promising and slightly hopeful. Now, they're dangerous. I think there's going to be a very long road. I think that the expectations have been wildly exaggerated, and the expectations about how quick things may be are unreasonable. All that being said, if I have to choose between the three roads, I think we're on the preferred road. And if we then take this back to how to escape Thucydides' trap, if there had been an attack on North Korea, or were to be, and if North Korea responded by destroying large portions of Seoul, and if we then had a second Korean War, and if then North Korea was about to disappear because the U.S. and South Korea would basically eliminate North Korea in a second Korean War, if that was the place it stopped, would China enter that war? And the Chinese regularly say, we already demonstrated that point, in 1950, when you approached our border the last time. So that would have been a path that could have triggered a war that China and the U.S. didn't want, but that they got dragged into because of the sequence of events. And if we could find a way to defuse that path, that would be one way to avoid Thucydides' trap in that instance. Now that leaves us other problems, Taiwan or the South China Sea, or other issues, but that's just an illustration. So let me conclude. So first we've done three things. We met a great thinker, Thucydides, and I hope some of you, especially students, will go download the Peloponnesian War. You'll learn a lot, okay? Uh, secondly, a big idea, Thucydides' trap. As Henry Kissinger has said, if you look through this lens, that's what's happening in the daily noise, in the relationship between the U.S. and China, you'll have the underlying driver. And the third fateful question is the one we need still more imagination about, is can we escape Thucydides' trap, in which the answer is for sure not by business as usual. So this will require imagination and ingenuity and adaptability, and I'd say that's the place where we all have an opportunity to exercise our imagination. And I'm hoping I'm going to hear some big ideas, so thank you.